So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for gathering here with us in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of New York. My name is Seth Ducharme. I'm the acting United States Attorney. Uh, and with my guest, John DeVito, uh, the special agent in charge from ATF, Bill Sweeney, the assistant director in charge of the FBI, Dermot Che, the police commissioner, Rick Patel from HSI, and Vince DeMarco, the United States Marshal. It's our uh, pleasure to speak with you today about what we uh, in law enforcement have been doing and are doing to deal with the alarming uh, rise and spikes in violent crime in the city and in certain pockets in the district. We have uh, an initiative uh, that's been underway for a, a short time now, which really complements uh, the work that we've been doing uh, historically. The initiative is called RASP the Rapid and Strategic uh, Prosecution Initiative. We'll be talking to you about what RASP means. But I think it's important to mention at the outset that you know the team around me has been working tirelessly uh, and for decades, really, uh, to protect the people of the community and in our district. And so while there are some things that are a little bit new and different that we're going to talk about today, uh, our core priorities and practices have not changed. Um, the office and our partners have always been focused on protecting the community against the threat of violent crime, gangs, uh, terrorism, and whatever emerging threat is facing us. And today I think it's clear that over the last few months in the city and in certain other pockets in the district, there really have been alarming uh, spikes in violent crime. And it is our responsibility to respond to that. Uh, law-abiding citizens uh, should have uh, no reason to fear uh, going about their daily lives in this city and in this district, and violent armed criminals should have much to fear, and that's really the goal. Somewhere uh, the balance has started to tilt a bit, and my perception is, is that the, the city and certain other pockets has become an environment which is too permissive for uh, armed criminal offenders uh, to walk the streets uh, at the peril of the public. And we are going to restore that balance so that the public feels at liberty to move about uh, and face the, the daily challenges of their lives, which have mounted over the last few months with COVID and other challenges. And we are going to send a clear message uh, to criminals, uh, in particular criminals who would abuse firearms unlawfully uh, to hurt people that our federal partners working with the New York City Police Department, the finest police department in the United States, will be identifying, apprehending, detaining, and incapacitating the individuals and the organizations which pose a threat to our community. We, as you know, have federal statutes that address much of the offense conduct that we're seeing in the city. So particularly uh, with respect to firearms offenses, there are a number of crimes under Title 18 United States Code, Section 922, some of which we've set out on, on a slide, which ca carry substantial penalties, and we will be aggressively enforcing those gun laws. We will also be bringing mandatory minimum charges when firearms are used in connection with drug trafficking offenses or other crimes of violence. And those offenses carry mandatory minimums of five, seven, ten, or more years. And those are powerful weapons, and we have used them responsibly historically, and we're going to use them responsibly now when we identify drivers of violence, individuals and organizations that pose a threat to the people in our community. We are confident in our investigator uh, partners and we have added capacity to increase the tempo. And by capacity, I mean we in the U.S. Attorney's Office have added 12 federal prosecutors, senior federal prosecutors with violent crime experience to supplement the great work being done in our organized crime and gang section, which has tirelessly worked violent crime and gangs, and our general crime section, which has worked reactive cases, upping our federal prosecutor capacity to approximately 40 AUSAs. And they are under the leadership and direction of myself, uh, Jack Dennehy and Laura Gatz, who are extremely experienced prosecutors 
And so those additional uh, people with this experience will lead to greater efficiencies. We are also working more quickly with our partners uh, in the New York City Police Department, the ATF, the FBI, HSI, and the Marshal Service to make sure that we are taking reliable data and information from the street, whether that comes in from the precincts, our uh, source networks, our federal databases, our state and local databases, and we are moving very quickly when we identify someone where the evidence supports a federal charge to bring that person into the federal criminal justice system to disrupt their violent behavior. So that's a long way of saying, you know, we notice what the people in this community notice too. Uh, we are not blind to the fact that it's become materially more dangerous uh, to live in, and make your life uh, and livelihood here in the city. And we have a responsibility to respond. We have the capability to respond. We have proven effective in protecting the city in this district against historically organized crime, gangs that invaded our communities, and the threat of terrorism, whether it was Al Qaeda or ISIS. And we know how to do this, and we're getting more proactive, and we're adding resources, and we're going to be out there on the street. So to criminals or would-be criminals, who feel that they have up to this point been able to operate with some impunity without fear of consequence, you're on notice. We, the federal government and our partners in the NYPD, are looking for you and when we find you we will apprehend you, detain you, and incapacitate you in a court of law. So those are the remarks I had that I wanted to communicate to you today. This project here in the Eastern District of New York is in some ways a subset uh, or sub-project of the Department of Justice's uh, national initiative, which is called Project Guardian, which was rolled out in November of 2019 to focus on gun violence. And this is, I think, uh, complementary of the work being done by the department nationally through Project Guardian, and it is our local tailored response to what's happening in the Eastern District of New York. So with that, I'll turn it over to John DeVito, Special Agent in Charge, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. John? Thank you, Seth. Again, my name is John DeVito. I am the Special Agent in Charge of ATF here in New York State. Um, it's always a great day when I can stand side by side with my law enforcement counterparts and reconfirm our commitment to serve and protect the communities that we all live in, support, and have an obligation to protect on a daily basis. I have a very simple philosophy when it comes to violent crime. Violent crime, much like cancer, is a systemic problem within our society that lacks a definitive cure. It's our obligation as law enforcement professionals and executives to continually develop innovative means by which to mitigate the risks that violent crime poses to the public. What you see today is this collaborative group working together as we always have to reconfirm our commitment to you the citizens of New York, that we are out there every day, and to also confirm to those individuals that pick up a gun in furtherance of their criminal activities, we are out there, we're waiting for you, and we will catch you. Thank you. Seth. Thanks very much, John. So now I'd like to invite Bill Sweeney, Assistant Director in Charge of the FBI. Thanks, Seth. Thanks, John. I'm joined up here by Jacqueline McGuire, who's our Special Agent in Charge of our Criminal Division here in the New York office. The spike in gun violence over the past several months has been alarming to say the least. Neighborhoods have suffered along with their victims and families and police officers face the monumental task of protecting the city in a profoundly different way than they used to. A few months ago, I saw a media report that suggested a mother threw her children when she, under a bed when she heard shots in the park one night. My guess is none of you that are out here today perhaps nobody that's listening to these broadcasts has ever had to do that. Stunningly, this is a reality for far too many people in this district. You've heard me speak in other investigations about society needing to do more to protect the most vulnerable in our neighborhoods. Children growing up in these neighborhoods deserve better, and overall, our communities deserve better. I'm here to address the public at large. But it's my hope that those living in the neighborhoods hardest hit by the gun violence will hear my message. 
You were the ones who suffered daily from the fallout of gun violence, and you cannot simply turn off your TV or walk away. The U.S. Attorney explained in some detail the initiatives this district has put forth to combat the spike in crime, and we're proud to stand here today together, along with our colleagues from the ATF, the Marshal Service, HSI, and the NYPD, to remind everybody that we certainly understand our shared commitment to protect everybody in the community. Decades ago, the FBI partnered with the NYPD to create the first joint task force of its kind between special agents of the FBI and NYPD detectives. This task force brought together all the stakeholders under one roof, and at the time, that task force existed to investigate bank robberies. Our relationship in particular developed over time with the NYPD, and more task forces were created to address different crimes and different threats affecting the city. The FBI Safe Streets Task Force, in where special agents and detectives work side by side to combat violent crime and gangs, is part of this model. The Safe Streets Task Force has been around for decades, and it's here to stay. This past June, we changed and we stepped up the efforts of that task force in neighborhoods hardest hit by the gun violence. As a result of this work, we've made nearly 40 firearms-related arrests since July 1st. That's 40 violent offenders who are no longer on the street. That's 40 violent offenders who are no longer out there with the potential to commit a violent act. Members of the Safe Streets Task Force are on the street as we speak, and we're focusing on individuals who are driving the violence in your neighborhoods. You will soon see social media messaging to get the word out there more directly. Our communities need to know that we are at work. Even more importantly, I want violent offenders to know the Safe Streets Task Force will leverage the full force of the federal justice system to hold you accountable. An arrest and a conviction on federal charges comes with significant penalties. If you are a violent offender arrested by this task force, chances are you will not be going home for quite a while. We fish with a spear and not with a net, and we are focused on you. We will not tolerate the continuing level of violence that we've been witnessing. For those of you that live in the neighborhoods that have been hardest hit by the gun violence, I encourage you to reach out with us to us with any information you may find useful. I know this is a tough ask, but your voice matters, and you can always reach us anonymously by calling 1-800-CALL-FBI or by a website, which is tips.fbi.gov. Attitude matters. Your voice matters. Partnerships between all of us up here and the community matter, and together we can reverse the increase in violence. The leadership team up here very much sees this as a partnership with you to protect our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Seth, thank you, Bill. Thank you, John. What you see here arrayed is a, is a recommitment, if you will, of partners that have been working steadily to reduce gun violence in New York City. We could talk about the statistics, but this is the summer where we lost a one-year-old child in a stroller on the streets of Brooklyn to gun violence. Think more recently in Queens, a mother in her apartment with her husband and children shot through the window and killed by a stray bullet. Let that sink in. And that answers every question why we are arrayed here today to renew our vow to not rest until gun violence and those responsible for gun violence in New York City are held accountable. I want to thank everyone standing behind me for their commitment, for their continued partnership, for the collaboration. That is not beginning today, it's strengthening today. As we sit here today, NYPD detectives on task forces across New York City are, as Seth just said, responsibly utilizing the laws at our disposal. Bill said the same message differently, with a spear, not a net. We are out in New York City every day, and we will continue to do our work, to do it with the utmost discretion, but make no mistake, the message today is very clear. If you carry an illegal firearm on the streets of New York City, we will not rest until you are brought to justice. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, I'm Rick Patel, Deputy Special Agent in Charge of Homeland Security Investigations in New York. I would like to thank Acting U.S. Attorney Seth DeCharm and his team of dedicated prosecutors and legal experts. I would also like to thank our federal, state, and local partners who are present here today. This initiative is an incredibly important one, and I, and I applaud EDNY for bringing us together to fight and stop and reverse the increased violence in our communities. Our success comes down to two abiding principles. One shared commitment to making our community a safer place and how we do that more effectively through our partnerships, as exampled here. There is no doubt that the sum of all our parts are greater than our individual efforts. As the investigative arm of the Department of Homeland Security, HSI remains committed to working together to prevent crime and violence here in our city and with our partners around the world. As we have watched over the past several months, violent crime continues to adversely impact each of, each of the five boroughs of New York City. Along with our partners here, HSI is responding to shootings and violent acts to gather real-time intelligence and initiate investigations using our unique statutory authorities. HSI leverages technology and our investigative capabilities to bring cases and ultimately charges against violent offenders, their organizations, and anyone that may profit from crimes involving violence. From the gang member, to the carjacker, to the weapons trafficker, on the street, on the internet, or on the dark web, we will find you, we will arrest you, and ultimately prosecute you for any crime that contributes to violence in and around our city. This includes anyone that transfers or profits from stolen merchandise, credit cards, or anything of value obtained from violent acts. The message should be clear. You do not have to be the one that pulls the trigger to be charged as a co-conspirator. We know that much of the violence is fueled by financial gain. Whether it be the sale of narcotics, the sale of firearms, the sale of stolen cars, or violent gang violence for turf wars, there are always victims being harmed. This needs to stop. The seriousness of the threat in any one of these areas is unprecedented. But taken together, these threats cry out for an even more concerted level of co cooperation and collaboration. With the integration of our investigative groups, we have been able to see who is involved, and while leveraging analytics and techno technological resources, we're able to identify the organizations behind the violence. Through this initiative, we will rely on each, on each other for new information, for experiences and best practices, for new ideas, and for new methods to reduce the violence in our city. The cooperation between federal, state, and local authorities and the swift action of this prosecutor's office continues to allow us to take violent criminals off the street and continue to keep our community safe. I thank you for your time. Thank you, very much. Thank you Seth. Deputy U.S. Marshals here in the Eastern District and on the Marshals Fugitive Task Force prioritize warrants that involve gun violence with the goal of increasing public safety by removing violent offenders from the streets to be prosecuted. And I want to thank uh, our U.S. Attorney for this strategic, for leading this strategic, coordinated, and collaborative effort. And we wouldn't be able to do what we do so well um, without our partners here behind us. So, thank you. Thanks, Marshal. I was recently out uh, with the Marshal at the Regional Fugitive Task Force and saw some of the work that you're doing. Um, very impressive there, the, the operation that's running and the Many of the violent offenders we're identifying, you know, may have uh, fugitive warrants in connection with our state or local cases, so that's an important res resource for us. So I want to thank all the partners. That concludes our planned remarks, and I think with John's help we can... Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So we have to, uh, first and foremost, we have a duty to uphold the, the rule of law objectively. So the prosecutions that we, were, that we are devoting resources to are not what I would call novel or unusual um, prosecution theories or exercises of prosecutorial discretion in the charges being brought. The, the difference is the allocation of resources to prosecute those crimes right now. And that's well within the discretion of our office and the discretion of our partners to choose what we're going to focus on. Now, we have an obligation to enforce responsibly you know, all federal, federal law, and we're certainly not going to abandon the very important work that we're doing in civil rights and national security and business and securities fraud. 
But what we are doing is we've asked people in our office to work a little extra harder and to contribute their prior experience to this particular effort. So these are federal crimes. We have a history of prosecuting them. And what we're doing now is we're exercising our discretion to do it essentially better and faster to meet the needs of the community uh, in the public safety sphere as we've identified it. So, so what is the principle within the discretion that's coming out? Can anyone be prosecuted if they have a gun in the street? Well, I mean, w no. I mean, as the commissioner and our partners have pointed out, there is a lawful way to own a firearm in New York City. If you're in compliance with firearms laws, you need near f fear nothing from the federal government. Yeah, so illegally, there's elements of offenses in the federal code. Now, the 922 section, you know, deals with more than just being a felon in possession of a firearm. So historically, if we had limited resources, we might look, say, m uh, more primarily to prior felons. There are other elements of that statute that can be enforced to have a material effect, I think, on public safety. And so you may see increased prosecutions in other 922 uh, sub-elements. I think what you're getting at is, you know, why this one and not that one? And to sort of coin a, a, a term of art that comes from Laura and, and Jack, we're trying to identify what we would consider to be drivers of violence or the greatest threats to the community. And that would involve looking at aggravators so that we're making sure that we use our resources efficiently. Aggravators could be a history uh, of crimes that had been prosecuted at the state level uh, where there was an essentially unsuccessful incapacitation. So now we're stepping in to use federal resources. It could be information coming to us through our databases, source networks, uh, field intelligence officers in the precinct that we consider reliable to suggest that a person is on you know a pathway towards escalating or increasing violence so we are trying to be efficient you know we're not going to cast a broad net we're certainly not going to prosecute everyone who technically could be prosecuted for a federal crime but we are focusing our attention on on people particularly involving firearms offenses where we think there's a likelihood that the, that there will be you know, serious or continued violence absent our action. I understand uh, that, you're, that you're focused right now on violent criminals, crime like turnstile jumping and, and part of the process? I mean, we don't prosecute uh, federal charges necessarily under the, the whole example when we had reliable information mobilizing towards violence to the potential danger of the fashion a reasonable uh, to disrupt violence that may initiate four corners of a charging document, perhaps that answers your question. Kind of resources that person that we look at is uh, the about are these task forces taking over some of the roles that have to stand the play on street crime unit used to do, and now that they're not there all the feds are picking up that stuff. So I will happily cede the microphone to my partners. Well, I'm an ATF agent, so we don't get to hire very often. But what we do have is a, a very small group of highly specialized criminal investigators, regulatory investigators across the country. Here in New York City, those investigators are working in conjunction with all of our partners uh, to focus on what we call crime gun intelligence. Crime gun intelligence is what we utilize to basically zero down to that 1% that's actually driving violent crime in our community. So we can't add any more resources to the streets, but what we can do is do our job more uh, efficiently, effectively, and to pinpoint what I call that cancerous tumor from the community and utilize all of our resources in a combined manner to eradicate that tumor from that good community, that good tissue, so that we can make the streets safer. It's all about being more focused to target those impact players, uh, those individuals that are driving violent crime in the community, I have three simple principles when I task my investigators out on the street. Number one priority is those individuals that are utilizing a gun and pulling the trigger. They are the ones driving violent crime. They are the ones forcing guns into otherwise individuals that would not pull the trigger. That 1% is our number one priority at ATF. So we're dedicating every resource. We're joining forces with NYPD, FBI, HSI, the Marshals in order to do that job more effectively. Okay. The second priority is those individuals that are supplying firearms to that number one priority. Those individuals have created pipelines all across the U.S. to funnel guns into market states like New York, where they have high uh, crime rates as well as strict gun laws. Because New York is a market state, we have to deploy very innovative means which to identify those traffickers 
and to stop the source of guns from coming into the state. And the only way we can do that is finding out who's pulling the trigger and how they're getting their weapons. The third priority is those violent criminals that are carrying guns on a daily basis in furtherance of their criminal activities waiting to become a shooter. That is the ATF strategy going forward and one that we dedicate all of our resources to on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. adding bodies. Uh, we added a uh, question on adding bodies. So we didn't add uh, agents or detectives. We added an intel component. It's something we did a little bit differently over the past several months than we used to do. Is the Safe Streets Task Forces used to focus on bigger, broader cases. And you guys have all seen them where it's large groups taken down at once. Because of the uptick we saw, we were looking to, f to identify the individual drivers of the violence. Who are the, who are the people out there carrying the guns, causing the shootings, but also carrying other predators, causing other predators to also start to carry a gun and engage in shootings. We also sat down months ago, Jackie and her team, and pretty much every leader up here at, at CompStats, focusing on different precincts and neighborhoods and trying to make sure that the expertise that comes from HSI, for example, or the expertise that comes from ATF and the expertise that our people might have were actually merged together, that our line agents and detectives we're all talking at that level because these task forces have existed for so long. The partnerships and relationships are becoming very uh, personal. So people know one particular precinct maybe better than the other. How do we leverage that better, if that makes any sense? Yeah, Jonathan, uh, I appreciate the question. When you look at where we are in New York City, um, in, in May when we shifted many of our anti-crime resources, um, to a more focused approach. As I said before, many of them stayed in the exact same precincts, um, doing this very similar job in uniform, in the same streets. That's neighborhood policing. They already know who the criminals are. Um, where we are right now in New York City is with an unprecedented, in recent memory, increase in shootings. We're actually up in guns recovered. We're up about 9% in gun arrests this year by the New York City Police Department. But I would say to you, that the answer to rising violence is not more stops. It's consequences for the guns that we do take off the street. It's smarter prosecutions. It's better partnership with both the federal and the state level in terms of getting those drivers of violence that the ATF just talked about. There's different levels in my mind. Who's in a gang? Who's carrying a gun for the gang? And then you get to the top of the pyramid Who's willing to pull out that gun and pull the trigger? And that's where we're all focused on. So I, I mentioned some of the statistics, but in a year where we had literally three months when New York City looked as close to a ghost town as I think any of us can remember, in a year where we have about 2,600 fewer officers on the street, we have 9% more gun arrests at this point as we sit here today. What we need to do is double down, not stops, consequences. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because it, it couldn't be further from uh, the truth. Uh, Eric Gonzalez in the Brooklyn DA's office um, is a key point of what we are trying to do, as well as our federal partners here. And, and this is a not one or the other. This is all one team leaning in the same direction, working for New Yorkers to keep the streets in New York City safe. I could tell you that uh, from the PD perspective, Every single gun arrest that we take off the streets, illegal firearm off the streets in New York City, goes through a CAT scan. Where did the gun come from? Who are we, who are we dealing with? Why are they carrying a gun? Where is the retaliation going to be? And we work extremely close with Eastern District as well as the prosecutors throughout New York City together, making decisions about how should this person be prosecuted? What is the best course of action? Not for the NYPD, not for the Eastern District, and not for the Kings County DA's office or any others. 
what's the best course of action for the people in New York City? And that's how we're going to continue to approach the situation. Commissioner, I could add to that, too. I, th I think if, if, if I didn't make clear before, you know, our efforts are really are and intended to be complementary to the work of the district attorney's offices. Uh, you know, I have met personally with the DAs in our district in uh, you know, from Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island, and we are coordinating very closely with them so that we can work in a, in a way that's not in tension uh, within our respective systems. I mean, the fact is we can do things in our system that they can't do in theirs and, and vice versa. Um, but there's been terrific coordination, you know, with our partners and with our executive management team, with all the district attorney's offices, and I really want to thank them, you know, for their continued uh, uh, coordination with us in what's really a, a whole of government approach to public safety. Thanks. Um, well, we're certainly looking at neighborhoods, yeah, where we see spikes in violent crime. So, for example, there's a couple of pockets in Brooklyn where we've seen some distressing trends and rises in violent crime. So, geography is certainly uh, one factor that could be considered in where to focus attention. Um, not the exclusive factor, but certainly we are looking at some, some pockets in Brooklyn in particular, but not to the exclusion of other parts of the city or the district. Well, so speaking from experience here, because I don't want to speculate too much, but the reason why we're devoting resources is historically, when we have worked with the New York City Police Department and our federal partners and coordinated with the DA's offices on a particular hot spot of violent crime activity, we've been successful in diminishing that activity for some period of time. Um, all of us who are up here can, I think, probably remember specific cases. I myself did a case in East Flatbush where we focused on a particular gang that was dealing in marijuana but primarily used guns as its tools of turf protection. And when we talked to people in the community after the takedown you know, of, of people, things were peaceful there for a while. Uh, and so that really is what the goal is. It's to change the landscape so that we can remove you know, by ones or twos or tens or twelves the drivers of violence and we can restore peace to the community and we can, we can provide that, that deterrent message, which sort of goes back to the theme I had at the beginning. I think, unfortunately, in some areas, there's a perception that the environment, the physical environment, allows uh, for, for tr truly bad behavior, the unlawful use of firearms and violence. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I'm looking, and I think we're all looking at just the, the same facts that you're looking at, the actual rises in violent crime. What's causing that? Uh, there's probably room for, for differing opinions as to all of the drivers. I can tell you my own perception is that uh, in the last few months with a combination of uh, COVID really containing people and threatening the way they live at, at a very fundamental level, forcing them sometimes to stay home or lose their livelihood, there was certainly a psychological and a, and a, and a physical reality to that pressure. And then there were uh, uh, sparks like the killing of George Floyd around the country, which uh, rightfully upset people and added a layer of grief. And the fabric, I think, of our community, the fabric that holds our social order together, was torn in places um, because of these traumatic events uh, for the country and for the city. And that created a climate, I think, my opinion, that, that caused people to engage in what had, has, what had previously been unacceptable and taboo behaviors to include violence against others. Um, so that is the climate that we're in, and we in law enforcement were in a reactive mode to a degree. We were dealing with the threat of COVID to our workforce, also enforcing laws that uh, protected the supply of PPE and the integrity of the markets for investment into vaccines, and we were trying to deal with the rise in violent crime in a way that was reactive. So I don't want to be an armchair psychologist here, but what I've seen in, what, in the city and both nationally is, you know, we, we had, a, we, we, we had a, a community that was contained with the social fabric of law and order and had been for quite some time with some degree of success here in the city. We enjoyed the benefit of that and, and the liberty associated with that. And then it, it filled with a flammable ether and there were multiple sparks and there were tears in the fabric. And that's partly what we're reacting to. We must restore and maintain the rule of law 
so that law-abiding citizens feel at ease and free and at liberty to enjoy the city again. You mentioned one of the things you're trying to do is speed up things. Yes. So do you have a target when the public well, I think the public should already be seeing changes. I mean, we started to roll out um, more gently than we are today, but some press releases, I think, back in August about the number of uh, uh, firearms offenses we had charged. You know, we, we announced 10 in one block in a short period of time. Um, you, you will certainly see more prosecutions. I mean, I'm signing indictments every week that relate to violent crime. And if you look for evidence of our efforts, you will see it in the public record. Today is, is really more about broader messaging to the community and transparency between the public and we in law enforcement who are, are sworn to protect the public and the Constitution to tell you how we're doing it. We see it, we take it seriously, we will uphold the rule of law, we will protect civil liberties, but we are going to very smartly focus on the people who are putting us all in jeopardy and, and we're going to remove them from society. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here, I, I, and Laura and Jack will correct me, we've done some in 24 hours upon receiving the tip. And that's the goal we're shooting for. Um, because the longer it goes, particularly with our partners in the DA's offices, the more complicated the transaction costs can be associated with parallel proceedings. So we're trying to coordinate very quickly when we identify a good case. All of our partners are upping their tempo. As, uh, as, as Bill said, the cross-communication within law enforcement is much better, so we can move as quickly as 24 hours. And just to piggyback off of that, you know, if somebody is brought up on federal charges, there is bail. Can you explain the difference? It is. So under the Bail Reform Act in the federal system, a federal magistrate judge will look at essentially two factors, the risk of flight and the danger to the community. And the government, the federal government in that proceeding will make a proffer of evidence and, and uh, that go to those factors, risk of flight and danger to the community. Our magistrates are very experienced uh, here. You know, we're an active district and they've seen cases like these, perhaps not uh, in the volume that they're about to see them. But they're familiar with, let's say, what we would call a classic felon in possession case. and. Uh, our detention rate has averaged a little, you know, about 70 percent uh, following an arrest for, for a federal firearms offense. So that's a pretty good odd that if you get apprehended uh, by these folks, you're, you're not going home. Well, it, yeah, so we, we, we can and we do, and that's the way you know, I'm, I'm looking at it. It's, it's we have the power and the resources to work these kinds of cases. They usually result in detention and they usually result in significant sentences. I know what we can do, and we see what the problem is. Uh, and so with some predictability, I think we're going to achieve, achieve good results in our system, as we have in the past. How many cases from the turned down? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, each case is assessed on a, you know, a case-by-case -case basis, and they can come in through multiple sections. We put RASP together to provide some overarching uh, uh, consistency between our sections, but gun crimes can come in really through any of our sections, and there is an intake, which is generally consistent, but I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, you know, how many we've turned down. Sure, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jonathan. So look, I, uh, the guiding principle is the rule of law and equal treatment under the law uh, for all the people in our communities. Um, we are going, when we have to go to a place geographically, for example, it's because we see we identify a need in that particular community. Um, we are not going into communities to pressurize the environment for the community. We are going into places to pressurize the existence of the handful of drivers of violence. So we have a sworn obligation to protect the people of the community, their constitutional rights, 
Uh, we take that more seriously than anything else to guarantee their liberties. And we are stepping in here because we see those liberties infringed by a small subset of people in the community who act intentionally to the detriment of others. So we're going to be very focused. Uh, we, we are not overextending ourselves to the point that we will be careless or reckless or cavalier. We will enforce the same high quality control and standards that we always do in federal court in the proud tradition of this office. And we know that, the, that our, our worthy adversaries in the defense bar and our very esteemed bench uh, will hold us uh, to, to that standard as well they should. So I'm confident that the cases that we bring will be just uh, and meaningful and appropriate and, and we will target bad actors uh, to the benefit of the community and not to their detriment. I'm confident we will do that. We have the experience and we have the right partners. To follow up on that bill question, mm. uh, so I'm trying to think. The last statistic I looked at that with respect to gun crimes, I think was about 22%, about 22% comparatively in the state system for gun offenses. Yeah. Look, I think it's a reasonable inference. If, if, if part of the goal of, of law enforcement is to deter uh, bad behavior, and you imagine our target set out there, and they are trying to balance risks, and they're saying to themselves, what is the risk that I will be apprehended if apprehended? What is the risk I will be detained if detained? What is the risk I will be punished for a long period of time? I think as a matter of common sense, that likely does play into the behavior that we're seeing on the street. More likely you are to be apprehended, detained, and ultimately punished. I think the more powerful the deterrent effect is. But I, you know, I'm not an expert on the state system. It's not where I practice, and, and some of those questions are probably you know, best directed to the experts who practice there, and those would be the district attorneys. I know what we can do. Okay, so look, thank you all very much for your attention this afternoon. The weather cooperated. Uh, if you have follow-up questions, you know, I would invite you to get in touch with John copies of the slides or anything else. Uh, but we'll continue to communicate with you as best we can as these, these cases move forward. I, th I think you will see a meaningful effect in the community. And I want to thank all the partners who stood up here with me today. Um, they are the essential uh, component in this. I'm sorry? The DEA right now is not, but the DEA is focused on narcotics trafficking both locally and internationally, which clearly cause harms to the community in other ways. The DEA certainly participates in the effort against violent crime, but right now, at least for present purposes, we thought this was the right core component to start with. DEA is, of course, a great partner, though. Thanks very much, everyone.